Our first scripture reading from today comes from the Old Testament, from the book of Isaiah, chapter 42. We'll be reading the first nine verses. It's entitled, The Servant of the Lord. Here is my servant whom I am uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his teaching the islands will put their hope. This is what God the Lord says, the creator of the heavens who stretches them out, who spreads out the earth with all that springs from it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, and that is my name. I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. See, the former things have taken place, and new things I declare. Before they spring into being, I announce them to you. And now from the gospel... Of Matthew will be in chapter 3, the baptism of Jesus. And then Jesus came to Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? And Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. And then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water, and at that moment, heaven was opened. He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And this is the word of God. So as you know, from children's time, we're going to be talking about baptism today. We're going to talk about a couple different aspects of baptism. So we're going to talk, you know, very briefly about the work of John the Baptist. We're going to talk about this particular scripture. And we're going to touch on what we as the church, the United Methodist Church, believe about the sacraments and about baptism. So obviously we will not exhaust all of these topics, but we're going to start a conversation today. So up first is John the Baptist. You remember I've told you he is one of my favorite people in the Bible. He's a little different, but he is very clear on his purpose and is very focused on shining the light towards Jesus, to helping people prepare their hearts and get ready for him. So he had been baptizing a lot of people at this point. He had preached a message of repentance a message of telling people to get their hearts ready. You know, at one point, he looked at people and called them a brood of vipers, you know, saying that this isn't something that you do for show, that it's something that should make a difference in their lives. You know, he's telling people there should be a change within them. But today, we see Jesus get baptized. And I think most of us would have the question that John posed. You know, in verse 14, it says, But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And you come to me. You know, it it brings to light the question that I think many of us ask, Why does Jesus need to be baptized? Jesus' answer to John is, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. And John agrees. But what does that really mean? Going to do this to fulfill all righteousness. You know, we're not really talking about fulfilling a scriptural mandate here. We have lots of mandates in scripture. This isn't particularly one of them. It says Jesus is fulfilling a mandate of God's righteousness, a mandate of God's will and of God's desire, you know, accepting God's will for the next part of the journey. 
Um, so we have a book in the United Methodist Church, and it's called By Water and the Spirit, and it explores what we believe about baptism. So it reads in part, in baptism we are initiated into the Christian church, we're incorporated into the community of God's people, so a specific church, the body of Christ, we're commissioned into ministry and called to continue the work of Christ for the redemption of the world. So you know, in this scripture, Jesus joins the people that he came to save. He enters into their community. He goes where the people are, and he joins the sinners. Something we'll see him continue to do throughout his, his ministry. The interpretation commentary explains that the one who will save their people from their sins consecrates himself to the vocation, joining the sinful multitudes in the Jordan River. You know, so the one who comes to seek and save the lost comes and is present with them, joins them where they are. You know, that is love personified right before our very eyes. You know, the commentary goes on to say he accepts the sacrament of the renewal of God's people. You know, so part of what we just talked about is that in baptism, you know, all of us are commissioned into ministry. So next week, we're going to look at several of the beginning aspects of Jesus' earthly ministry. But now, before all that starts, he is baptized and prepared for ministry. You know, and of course, in this scripture, we have a very Trinitarian picture. We don't have to look very hard to see it. You know, that the Holy Spirit descends upon him in that moment and that we hear the very voice of God say, this is my son whom I love and with whom I am pleased. You know, and that tells us of God's love for us, that Jesus is present to extend this gift. And uh, we're going to continue the baptism discussion, but we're, as they used to tell me in seminary, we're going to put a pin in that moment. We're going to come back to it and explore that idea a little further. But I do want to make sure I lift up that baptism is one of the two sacraments we recognize in the United Methodist Church. So the other is communion when we come together every month to join each other at the table. You know, that a sacrament by definition, an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace, like joining our two worlds together. You know, that there are signs and acts involved in the sacrament. So in baptism, you know, it's water that is primarily on display. You know, as we share the water, we recount the story of the water throughout Scripture you know, you're always going to see me pour the water so you can see it and hear it and sense it because it's such an integral part of the sacrament. You know, through God's action and promises, the ordinary becomes sacred and holy. And that water becomes more than water in baptism. So in communion, you know, it's the bread and the juice that are transformed into something more and that we treat Likewise, one of the other parts of why we recognize two sacraments, um, because not, some churches recognize more than two, United Methodist Church, we say we recognize two because Jesus tells us specifically to continue to do these things. So we share that part from Scripture in our communion liturgy every time we share the meal together. And um, when we think about baptism, we go to the concluding words of the Gospel of Matthew and we read the Great Commission that says, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And then Jesus came to them and said, All authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you to the very end of age. He tells them to continue the work of baptism in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And just like there was a very real presence of God and the Holy Spirit at the baptism of Jesus, it's true every time we celebrate a baptism today. You know, that we make no mistake 
that in this sacrament, it is God at work and not us. You know, that baptism is God's expression of love and grace in a person's life. You know, that um, in infant baptism, not all churches sell, you know, share infant baptism. In infant baptism, we are sharing, you know, in a very real way, John Wesley's understanding of prevenient grace, the grace that is active in our lives before we are ever aware of it. You know, I hope that captivates you as much as it captivates me, that long before I ever truly understood who God was in my life, God's grace was active in my life, calling me into a relationship with Christ. And we celebrate that in infant baptism. And because God's always faithful to God's promises. That's why we only have baptism once in our life. You know, to do so otherwise would to say that God needs to renew God's promises. We can come and reaffirm our faith to recommit ourselves to our promises, but God is always true to every promise he makes us on our faith journey. Um, I've used the word grace a lot here in the last couple paragraphs, in the last couple moments. And, you know, grace, to put it succinctly, is just God's unmerited favor, active in our lives, that there is nothing we will do to earn it, but it is given as a gift out of love. So I said we'd come back to that moment, that moment where we talk about love being evident in what is being discussed today. Um, that I said specifically that Jesus coming to be baptized, to join with the people that he came to save, is love personified. It's love on display. It's love evident. Um, and I have thought so many times over the past weeks, in varying degrees of this next conversation, but I remember that last spring when it became evident that um, we, mom and I would be moving here, you know, in preparing for a final sermon with a congregation, you're thinking, what do you hope they remember about your time there? What have I faithfully been able to share that, you know, I hope this is what sticks? And there are several things that come to mind, and there is one I am going to share with you today because I decided in that moment that then I needed in the next part of the journey, to be intentional to make sure I was sharing those moments that are incredibly important. Um, and part of that is just to come repeatedly remind each and every one of you of how much you were loved by God. You know, we talk about that in Scripture, and we talk about understanding that in our head, and John Wesley was very good at reminding us of the connection between our head and our heart, and, you know, my prayer would be, I am sure in your heads everybody is confident in that. I would pray that you experience that. As one of the speakers said this weekend, you know, when they were talking about transformation, they said, that's a game changer. You know, when you experience it, when you just not know it and trust it, but you feel it in everything that you are, when you have one of those moments where the love of God absolutely overwhelms you, it takes you farther in your faith than anything else ever will. So, you know, I pray that, that sometimes, I know in my case, God had to break down some walls so I, could, so I could experience that. That, you know, that we seek that, that we are praying for it, that we are open to it when we are in scripture and in prayer, and that whatever God needs to do for us to be confident and assured and experience his love, that that happens through him for us. Amen.